series from the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Greetings to podcast listeners. My name is Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. And the podcast this week is via request from a wonderful woman, extraordinary woman, who basically has one of the best names I've ever heard in the history of the planet. For those Fleetwood Mac fans out there, we're doing a requested podcast from Rhiannon. Yes, Rhiannon. Rhiannon is terrific, and she's asked us to produce a really useful podcast for men and women who are thinking about innovative ways to disseminate their research. And Rhiannon particularly wanted us to think about academic journalism. And indeed, academic journalism, which can be a compound noun or an adjective and a noun, is about academics making a decision to write journalism. It may be commentary, it may be news pieces, it may be some other form of prose. But there really is a very distinct set of skills required to write a thousand word piece of journalism. The notion that all academics can write journalism is absolutely ridiculous. It's a very, very specific series of skills. So Rhiannon, one of our wonderful students at Flinders, wants to write journalism, but is working in what she's described as an unpopular area of criminology, which I find fascinating. So she's not working in gun control. Obviously, lots of people are interested in guns. She's not working in drugs. A lot of people are interested in drugs. She's working in the area of corporate crimes, corporations and their crimes and governmental crimes, which can I say I find truly fascinating and I'd like to read journalism about that. But she's had some challenges trying to convince people to publish journalism in this area because she's described it as sort of unpopular culture for popular culture. Mm. So I wanted to talk about this topic with Steve Redhead, Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders, because besides being a criminologist, so working in the same area as Rhiannon, he's also written 17 books. The 18th book is coming out next year as well. And he wrote a book, one of his books, is called Unpopular Culture. So it's quite useful, and it was dealing with law and popular culture. Mm. So I thought we would talk about this today. So Steve, hello. Hello. And how fantastic is Rhiannon's commentary and desire to get this very fascinating area of criminology out into the public domain. So, Steve, let's start with, I mean, you've written a hell of a lot of journalism through the entirety of your career, so have I, and very few academics do. They've had the sustained commitment to journalism that we've had. So, Steve, what are the characteristics, do you think, of good academic journalism and, indeed, good academic journalists? I think it's a, it's a really difficult question to answer, but crucial for uh, the way that we communicate our research, mm. especially now. And I do think it's interesting that she's suggesting, and she's right, that the sort of area that she's working in is, in, in, in quotes, unpopular as far as journalists are concerned. I mean, that area, collectively called white-collar crime, um, is fascinating oh. and a very important uh, part of what uh, criminologists have called crimes of the powerful in the past. But the reason that crime is um, forgotten about a lot of the time, and it's, this has been going for decades, is because the media has left it alone. It has seen it as uninteresting or not as relevant as the real crime, in inverted commas, the street crime or uh, whatever it is. Um, I think in terms of how academic journalism has developed, you have to look at digitisation. Um, but I think, I think certainly in my own career, um, I got slagged by journalists who said, uh, this is too academic, and by academics who said, this is too journalistic. And I think I, you know, I've kind of worked that double blind as much as I could, but I still get that. And I think you have to be prepared to accept that. Um, I think through digitisation, though, there is a blurring of that academic journalistic um, it's partly the way that things are written, partly the sort of language that uh, you're writing in, but also now what you've got is the ability for a any academic student or staff to write blogs, for example, which are, are picked up or not. Um, but that online journalism makes a difference, and it's something that people didn't really have in the past, whether they say they did or not is, is irrelevant. Actually, digitisation has made a difference. Look, it has, and we're going to return for Rhiannon, I think, back to blogs at the end yeah. 
of yeah. this conversation. But let, let's talk through those characteristics. The first thing we need to say is being a great academic journalist is very, very difficult. Mm. And 99% of what we read as academic journalism is drivel, is nonsense. I find very, very low quality. It seemed to be sort of sub-academic work. Actually, it's the best and the brightest and the shiniest of academic work that you're actually able to configure in a Gramscian sense to move common sense on to good sense, which is what we're after. And often what it involves, guys and gals, listening to this is you have one strong crystalline idea. Mm. So the best of journalism is a thousand words, often written in one go, mm. obviously hundreds of drafts coming after that, mm. but you're able to write in one piece. It has a clear spine and you've got something to say. And the best of writers, and can I say I have the great privilege of being married to Stephen, he is a magnificent writer, and on a good day I can turn a good phrase as well. But the reason Steve and I have been so successful as journalists is because we're both very, very good writers, and we can write the hard and difficult high theory work, but we can manage our modality and move through a diversity of audiences as well through language choice. So the best academic journalists often write in short sentences, but have a very, very wide vocabulary, so they're able to be very considered in their language choice and their word choice, have, have something to say. You've got to have an argument, a point you want to make across, and there can't be ambivalence in that. You've got to cut, in some ways, the academic, let me present the other side of this discourse. That stuff's gone, I think, when you're doing academic journalism. Mm. You're presenting a spine of an argument. How am I going, Steve? Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely spot on. Um, I, I think it's it, it's really about um, being able to communicate complex ideas simply. Yeah, I think that's that's more than anything what it is, and um, that is a real skill. Um, and you, you can do that uh, over a period. You know, you can work on that kind of um, you know complex to simple, but uh, it really is something, uh, you know, the best of that sort of journalism is in, in, incredibly difficult to do. I'm writing a book called Theoretical Times at the moment, which comes out next year, which focuses on, um, you know, famous theorists like Alain Badiou or Slavoj Žižek, who are really magnificent examples of people who can um, communicate, if you like, journalistically, Ideas which have taken four or five hundred pages in their more theoretical work to develop, and and uh, there's always another four hundred, five hundred page book about to come out, which is going to look at those complex ideas next week. Yeah. But they're actually able to write, um, in quotes, journalistically, at a at a complex level, but are able to communicate those difficult ideas. They're great examples of of what I would say is is academic journalism but I, I think the part of the issue for people who are just doing if you like citizens ju citizen journalism yes. um which is what digitization has provided is um is that people can get into the forum of ideas and you can practice you can actually get ideas across um you know in ways in in which uh, you'd never have been able to do in the past. You would, you'd have, there'd have been gatekeeping which would have stopped you. Yeah, that's exactly right. And can I just loop back on that great point you were making? If you really understand something, so if you have written a book on it, you've written 450 mm. pages mm. on it, a really great academic journalist so understands that field and the argument they were making yeah. that they can move 110,000 words into 1,000 words for a different audience. That is the magical skill. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And someone like Bojo, who's oh, yeah. another of the theorists that I'm writing uh, about in Theoretical Times, is a wonderful example of that. He was slagged off for both his academic books <laughs> and his journalistic books. But the more you look back, or the more I look back at what's been called uncollected Bojo, the stuff that was really in the... Um, the flotsam and jetsam of, of journalism and newspapers and everyday writing, and there's lots of it in Baudrillard's case, um, there's a whole astonishing genre there. This is something, I say, which takes a great deal of skill to get right, and he's a great example of someone who did. Now, Steve, you've, you've already mentioned quite a few times about the online environment, and I agree it's changed everything. You and I are so old that we both wrote for print, mm. and particularly you wrote for print yeah, and then moved into the digital environment. Of course, I wrote yeah. for the Times Higher, which is both print 
and online yep. and hundreds of articles and I yep. still write for them yep. now. But what are the challenges, do you think, in writing journalism for the online environment, particularly for PhD students? I immediately went to a whole area, but I'll hold back for a second there. What are the challenges, do you think, for PhD students' early career as moving into online journalism? Well, I think there are challenges, but I think there are, what I said before is true. It's just the opportunities which have, have yeah. now been opened up. It's a huge um, space that has been opened up for people. It's, you know, say people are writing in media communications, which I've taught, taught in a lot, particularly in areas of sport and media cultures. You know, a lot of my students, for example, at University of Brighton, who were going to be journalists, sports journalists, yeah. um, that's what they were studying, were able even then to, to write online. That developed them as, you know, career, career journalists. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. 20 or 30 years before that, they would never have been in that position. It was a fascinating space to look at when those students, and, they, and, and a lot of them have gone on to be good sports journalists, very often with an online career. They, they practiced by doing that. Yeah. They really did. And that's great. Remember, use the URLs on your CV yep. too. You can really show Absolutely. the portfolio career. Yeah. The only variable I would put in, because I went negative at the start, so right. being married to a Northern Englishman has had a long-term impact on my life and sensibility. But maybe this is more of a, a woman thing, so I'll just put that out there. But when you write in the online environment, particularly in professional journalism, the comment culture can be absolutely ruthless and yes, debilitating. Yes, I agree. It's... And, and so you've got to toughen up, princess. And I'd really say this to the women out there. If yep. you're going to go out there... You've got to be prepared to think about the worst thing yeah. that anybody could ever call you, mm. and you're going to get that on a daily basis. Okay? Yes. I have had men who have read my journalism in the Times Higher Education who have physically tried to stop me moving through a car park mm. and being able to get on a train. Mm. They, they so hated what I had to say mm. that they physically were trying to stop me actually getting home after a day's work. Okay? Yeah. So. This is this. Don't pretend for one moment this is all sweetness and light. Or it's about profile, darling. Getting your name online. It's just just be aware that some really dreadful trolling and you know often physical, emotional attacks will come at you with such a ruthlessness that it'll take your breath away, Steve. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the big challenge and the big difference from a, you know a pre-digital age when people still got slagged off when they wrote things as, as, as journalists, for example. Um, but it was, I think it was certainly not as, as um, widespread. The hate was still there. Yeah, but also remember for the, for the women out there, you're, you're academics, you're brilliant people, yeah. and you've written this brilliant article, and people are going to say to you, I really don't like your hair. Yeah. You know, gee, you're ugly. Yeah. Right, so all that sort of stuff, that you might mm. be the brightest person in the world, but people will feel absolutely able to do all these cheap shots about how you look. Yeah. So either you okay. don't go into that space, yeah. or you've got to toughen yourself or up. Or you stop. You know, or you if stop, you feel that's, that, right. That it's, that's right. The trolling is getting too bad, and I understand that. Yeah, so just I just want to raise that to be aware of that. So don't think it's all sweetness and light. No. It's a really tough, nasty, yeah. ruthless environment. Yeah. So, Steve, what would you recommend for the more specialised topics, if you like, using Rhiannon's phrase, unpopular, mm. unpopular topics? So what happens to those specialist topics and journalism? What would you recommend for Rhiannon? Well, I, th I think that the idea of, the, if, if you like, the blog culture is that you can choose to, to focus on the areas that are, are unpopular. But I think it's a struggle, actually. The, the whole point about... Uh, media and communication as an area uh, for something like the area of white collar crime is that it's a struggle to get that work and the good work on it and there's a lot of it uh, into the public arena yeah. so I think the point is not to accept that that's simply always going to be unpopular but actually to keep the good work going and to find spaces that it can be exposed yeah, and look, we'll go straight into the blog situation there because if I was offering advice to Rhiannon, and I always try to offer advice mm. to our students, as not as their supervisor mm. but as a mate on the side mm. to offer alternative views for their consideration and yeah, their career. Absolutely. With Rhiannon and with people working in these specialist areas, 
I would now develop your career through a blog. Yeah, definitely. So with Rhiannon, I would recommend that once a week, mm. whatever she's writing in a thesis, she takes 500, 600, 1,000 words mm. and makes that a blog. Yeah. And what that does, Rhiannon, is that builds up your portfolio. It can all go on your CV. It can show the type of dissemination that you're doing. But then I would triangulate that. So every week that you've done that, that blog post, I would tweet it out, mm. come up with a standardized hashtag that you use all the time that will start to build up the branding of you and your expertise in that field. Put it on LinkedIn. Yes. I think LinkedIn would be the crucial variable for you because criminology and that sort of white white collar crime perhaps is of interest to colleagues on LinkedIn. Yep. Build that up. Do the links to Facebook. So start to triangulate social media around your blog. And what that will do, Rhiannon, it's like in the old days, people like Steve and I used to give our journalism away for free for these smaller organisations. Yes. I did Heart, Arts Hub, mm. you did some work for the Socialist Register and so forth as well. Um, well Marxism uh, Today. I did I certainly wrote for Marxism Today. And I was, rec- you know, people would ask me to do it, and I, I would say I'll do it for nothing. I was interested in getting the ideas out, and I still am. I wrote for a um, website called Culture Matters recently. Um, at, at, at request, and I was really, really pleased to do that. And I think it's interesting. You could take an example. Certainly, Rem could take an example mm. from um, the Teesside Centre for Realist Criminology oh, yes. at the University of Teesside in the UK. I'm on the international advisory board of that great centre, and they have a wonderful blog. Actually, they have a centre blog, mm. which has in has over. Uh, eight or nine months that it's existed, has had blogs from um, the academics who are working in the research, different areas of research, and they've blogged on their research. Really fascinating. It, it's been digested widely, but also some of the PSC students have done that on oh, their wow. research, particular areas, like white collar crime, for example. But I think if she takes a look at that, or students take a look at that, you've got an example of what an academic research centre can do through social media. See, now that's it. I think that's the important variable. And so, Rhiannon, what that does, gets the work out, also showcases your research for possible employers. And also, what you're demonstrating to journalists, perhaps, is you can then show the sort of work you do and they can see it. So you're building your own branding. I am an expert in this area. And you're not going to be reliant on the gatekeepers at this point. So, Rhiannon, the point I was making to you is Steve and I, to start our career and our when we were about your age, we gave it away for free. Yeah. We gave the writing as I was learning, darling. So yeah. I wrote for Arts Hub and I gave that work away for free. Mm. And that meant when the Times Higher came a calling, that was the paid gig, and can I say a very well paid gig? And I'm still working with and for them now is they were able to see that work I'd done, Mm. seeing that I could manage a weekly column, because remember the challenges of that, I wrote a weekly column for, what, three, four years? Mm. So every week, no matter what else was happening in my life, I had to deliver a 1,000 words on something. So if you can show that you have regularly produced high-quality work on a topic, then you've branded yourself, you've become the expert in that field, and I think editors would therefore very much like to uh, hire you because there's no risk in hiring you, hiring you because you've shown that you can do it. Yeah, very much so. I think that's right. That's how it works. But, um, you know, the, the interesting thing now is that there are so many great examples of what we're talking about out there. So you can look online and see bad and good examples and ways that it's, the good stuff's been taken up. Yeah, so this is what we call, Rhiannon, disintermediation. You no longer need the gatekeepers. You no longer need the multiple layers and levels. You can write something, and you know, WordPress is very, very straightforward, mm. very easy to use, and you can find an audience. Yeah. It'll be slow. You need to use social media to triangulate interest in your work, but you can do it without being reliant on any editor going mm. yes or no or I'm not, not terribly interested. Rhiannon, just get on with it. You're a great scholar. Start to show the world what you can do exactly. and other people will follow you yeah so i hope this has been useful very interesting series mm. of conversations steve the world has changed in the last five ten years yeah. i think for academics thinking about disseminating their work and for the inverted commas unpopular bits of academic life they've got a new energy and a new engine to get their work out there that we never saw that's exactly right
for more information about the Office of Graduate Research at Flinders University, please refer to www.flinders.edu.au slash graduate dash 